And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, In Memory Computing, Myths and Facts, sponsored by Greg Gang. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. I'm proud to introduce to you our speaker for today, John Webster, Great Gains Vice President and Product Management. John brings significant expertise to Great Gains Systems with over 15 years of senior and global technology and sales history with notable global companies including Net, uh, Nettuitive, Microsoft, Amber Point acquired by BEA and Oracle, and Silverstream Software acquired by Novell. John has also been, held a number of technical roles with an early adopter of Java for use in an online gaming startup he co-founded in 1996, while also developing his expertise on J2EE and Java application servers. John holds a BS with honors in computer science from the University of Western Ontario, Canada. And with that, I will give the floor to John to start the, pre the presentation. Hello and welcome, John. And thank you so much for the uh, kind words introduction and uh, just happy to be here today. Thank you everyone for joining today. Hopefully I can cover some of the common uh, myths and facts of in-memory computing and dispel some of the stuff that I see across the industry as sort of common misconceptions, if you will. As Shane mentioned, I'm Vice President of Product Management here at Great Gain Systems. We're a leading provider of in-memory computing platforms and technology. And uh, I'm happy to be sharing some of our experience with uh, everyone today. Uh, even though uh, everyone is muted, I do enjoy uh, questions, um, and I am happy to uh, happy to answer them as we go. And, uh, of course, along the way. So if you think of something, make sure you queue it up and put it into the chat section, and uh, we will address that as um, as we uh, as we go here. Sad thought would be useful is to give you a definition or at least a definition, my definition of what memory computing actually is. It's obvious to everyone in the industry that in memory computing has come to the forefront as it were with major vendors like SAP, uh, Oracle's recent announcement, many other startups here uh, in Valley um, and other places doing a lot of work around in memory and of course it's it seems sort of intuitive that if I'm talking about memory, then I, I obviously must be faster. Um, so our formal definition here is that we, you know, view as using high performance integrated and distributed memory systems to be compute, process, analyze, and transact on large scale data sets uh, in, in real time. And I, I don't want to digress into a discussion of you know what deterministic real time is as it you know compares to the high frequency traders in New York, for instance. But think of real time as essentially application time or milliseconds, nanoseconds uh, is is sort of the SLAs that we approach. And I think in memory computing, ideally suited for often you cannot approach without using some type of in memory computing platform. And it's really very much orders of magnitude faster than legacy disk based systems. There's a couple things I'd like to point out here. This is not about partial caching of data. Um, it's not even about simply having a database residing in memory, although that certainly does get us closer to an in-memory computing platform, and it certainly is a necessary component of any in-memory computing that you're going to be doing. The point with in-memory computing, for me, is that the primary data set in memory. We design our product with a memory first architecture. And by that, what I mean is that exactly that, is that I assume that my data set, my entire data set, is residing in system RAM. And it's important, we'll come back to that in a second as compared to a whole lot of the flash technologies that you're seeing here. And this really is not just about being faster. Parse caching, caching technologies, Though that's about being faster. That's about having faster 
access to disk space technologies or making up for deficiencies in disk space things. And what I see in my customer base is that in-rate is very much transformational. These are new types of workloads. There are new types of problems that we're approaching. Often, there are problems that have presented themselves in the last 18 to 24 months as things like sensors and streaming data have come more and more into all of our environments. Now, the other thing that you uh, are seeing, and we are certainly seeing, is that the, the time is ripe, if you will, for in-memory computing. The time is ripe for for a significant change. And the reason for that is, uh, here's a truism that we all know, data is exploding. But also data types are, are exploding. Event data, clickstream data, all sorts of the the, uh, the exhaust, if you will, from all these network events and everything that all of these systems in our lives become more and more instrumented are creating. And the memory is dropping year over year. And uh, it is really, uh, exciting the the adoption of flash based technologies and flash in memory and, and things like that, which we'll we'll talk about in a slide in a second. And really, study after study from the analyst firms and certainly substantiated by our customer base is that one of the top corporate imperatives, some kind of in memory computing system, in memory databases. Certainly, we've heard a lot about that at SAP Hana, for instance, is very prevalent. We're seeing that it's very one of the top corporate imperatives that we're seeing across the industry and across uh, certainly our customer base. I'd like to point out a couple of things to, to, to really just kind of highlight how profound I think this change is actually going to be for all of us in, uh, in the industry. Um, back to the 70s, those of you that are on the line that were uh, you know, still working uh, or working in the 70s or Certainly, I'll give those learn a bit of a history lesson here. IBM released the Winchester hard drive. And that, that's, that's what, 43 years ago. That's not that long ago. Um, and it really ushered in the era of hard disks. And if you look at what happened in terms of storage and hard disks, effectively, you know, a gigabyte of storage is almost free at this point. Point, uh, from from any sort of corporate standpoint, certainly, and I will bet everybody on the phone has got a terabyte or two in random drives, external drives that they have sitting around in their basements or offices. But what is the introduction of, of hard disks? Obviously, they were very expensive at the beginning. What you saw was the decline in the utilization of tape, which was really the de facto thing that everyone was using prior to that. You also saw the introduction of C well, ushered in the era of structured data, and of course, all of the things that have flowed on from that. So what you've got here in the 2010s, as it were, you've got 64 bit CPUs and, and DRAM prices are dropping 30% year over year. And I am, my intention is, is that it certainly has ushered in the era of memory. Fundingly, expect you to see disks start to decline. Now I'm caveat this for a, for a second. I'm not saying that hard drives won't exist anymore. I'm not saying that there's going to be plenty of storage and substances and all of the things that we need. But what I am saying, partner agrees with me, is that RAM really the new disk and disk Italy going to become, at least, the new shape where you put things for sort of long-term durable storage and the disaster uh, when you need to turn the light um, and put all those things back together again. So um, you are seeing things like NoSQL and NewSQL and, and all of that coming onto there and really about to see the era of unstructured data coming here. And again, SQL is not going anywhere. SQL will certainly be with us. My overall point that I, I, I like you to take home is very much a profound change that is on the level of the web. It's on the level of cloud and the impact on our industry and the technologies and the way that we build applications is going to be uh, um, correspondingly as profound. So 
what I'm talking about in terms of memory first versus disk first. Well, really, this is about primary storage. I mentioned that already, and it's essentially disks are for backups. This is, you know, again, disks are virtually free. We're actually seeing a decline in the use of disks for our high performance. And if you think about it, the latency of accessing data on from memory is in the seconds. And you're really just doing pointer arithmetic. It's an AI call to get your data. When you're using disk in a disk-first architecture, which is what you see in most traditional RDBMS systems and most of the things that we've built out over the years, it's really an API call, which is going to engender a some sort of level of OS call and I.O. you're going to go through the I.O. stack, you're going to hit some hardware, you're going to be on a different bus, and then ultimately you're going to pick things off of either a spinning disk or a solid state drive, uh, which of course is faster than spinning disks, but nonetheless, you've still got latency in milliseconds, if not worse than that, um, depending on what you're retrieving. And an important thing I always like to say is just because you can scale doesn't mean that you're in memory. Just because you've got a cache, for instance, or just you've increased performance, it's really not synonymous with the same thing, as it were, um, as in memory. Things that's also different from an in-memory computing technology stack standpoint is that it inverts what you might call the, the normal or the standard application architecture. And by that, I mean if you're looking at um, any client server, even to J2E and various other things, your, your data is always moving around. You've got data hiding in some sort of repository, database, system, flat file, whatever it might be. In order to process or do something, you're either looking into that database, taking the data out, you're processing it on your application tier. Maybe you're putting result sets back. Maybe you're or, you know, updating data, rather. You're returning result sets, whatever it might be. The point is, is that things are moved. They're not partitioned. They're in a central database, you know, centralized database. And again, that's not to say that that database isn't clustered. Obviously, it is. We know that that's a very standard thing to do. But it's actually impossible. You can't actually send the application to the data in the way that you can with in computing. Now, let's talk a little bit about Hadoop because Hadoop is a great example of exactly what I'm ta talking about. One of the advantages of Hadoop, and in my opinion, the reason that it is as popular as it is among the, the cost and durability and sort of cheapness of it, as it were, is that what Hadoop has done for us is it has essentially democratized parallel computing. Doing parallel computing, and the folks at this company have been doing parallel computing, you know, for 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 decades in some in some cases. But traditionally, it's been very challenging or difficult and hard and sort of limited to, um, you know, some very specialized use cases before you're actually doing true parallel processing. Now, enter Hadoop, MapReduce, and MapReduce being a very common and sort of easily understood notion in, in terms of parallel processing, it does this over spinning. Um, takes things from days to hours, hours to minutes. Never designed for real-time workloads, but very much about bringing the computations to the data. That is, in fact, what MapReduce does. Now, it's not that's not the only way to do parallel processing. Um, and within memory computing, the same notion. You've got a partition data set, data residing in memory, and then an ability to compute or transact on that data. And we certainly do MapReduce, we do MPP, we do a variety of different kinds of parallel execution on our front for top of these things. And the difference is, is that by doing this, by sending the data, uh, sorry, the compute to the data, you can actually get what you might call almost unlimited scale. I've never been able to, if I'll speak for my own product for a moment, I've never been able to not scale. I've never reached a theoretical maximum uh, in terms of the scalability, and that's because, again, memory first architecture that we've actually put together and, and be able to uh, be able to do that. And you can very much actually approach the theoretical minimum in terms of the ability to uh, scale and access data. You know, the, 
this, this, it's, I'll, I'll share just an anecdote with you. One of the things that we always say uh, at Greek Games certainly is that the first law of distributed programming is to not distribute. And map reduce is, is really very much one of the first paradigms to do it. So my overall point on this is that data is not enough. It's not sufficient. An in-memory database in and of itself is enough. You absolutely need a compute component uh, as well. So talk about what myths. The first thing that I hear here always sounds great. I want to be able to do things differently. I want to be able to have limit, uh, you know, virtually unlimited scale. I want to be able to do it on commodity hardware. I want to be able to scale up, scale out, whatever I want to do. Sounds great. But this is just too expensive. And that is certainly a legacy of where we were 24 to 36 months ago in terms of RAM pricing, in terms of what uh, it costs you to lay these kinds of things. Now, what I can tell you is, and I tell you for a fact, this is, this is I actually just wrote a check for this for, for one of engineers. There, uh, very simply, is a character of DRAM cluster. It's really about 10 blades. And we were able to buy this for about 25k, including shipping <laughs> and racking and storing uh, and putting this into our uh, into our data center, as it was. So very, very cost effective. So you can scale it up 10 terabytes is a quarter million dollars. That's not really uh, really too much. You know, you can absolutely approach this in very, very, very variable fashion. Um, and and it's, it's interesting that, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago where terabyte was sort of the purview of, of giant resource or, or organizations. But, you know, you can certainly have this in your data center very, very simply. Um, by 2015, we expect this price to drop even further. So the hardware enablement on this, you know, we expect to, you know, to see a terabyte of hardware on commodity blades around 10000 bucks, right? Again, do the math on that in terms of your data set and where you actually want to do that. You know, traditional types of technologies and even the big data technologies can't deal with the latencies associated with this. Making, uh, making this very much, uh, uh, you know, very much about in memory, by very much about DRAM. And then the very interesting thing that's actually coming along here now that we're seeing a lot of is memory channel storage. This is not PCIe based stuff. This is, you know, flash SSDs, solid state drives. What I'm talking about is actually flash in DRAM form factor. It's about twice as fast as, as, as Flash, and it's pretty much the same price point as, as it is. And what that allows me to do is have randomly accessible summary available to me, and uh, uh, some following consequences in terms of price, making this even more affordable. In that, Flash itself obviously is, is a cheaper technology; you don't have to spend as much money for it. it also, sits for when compared to DRAM, and you've got a very interesting thing where you can see um, a lot of very cost-effective. Uh, Cost effective things coming to the market where power cooling, you know, I've seen things like 512 cores and 44 terabytes of flat based memory in 2VU. So, again, think of your data centers and think of how quickly and easily you can scale to some very substantial, substantial levels here. So, point being, you know, too expensive is just simply not, not anymore um, for, uh, for the current state of the art, as it were. Now, the second thing I always invariably hear, particularly from my, my friends who uh, are in the RDMS world, is that, it's like, hey, you know, in memory, oh, this sounds great, but it's not durable. It's just, you know, it's just kind of cash. Stuff, stuff, you know, stuff, the power's out. And this is simply not true. All mature IMC platforms have durable backups and disk space storage. You can do very interesting things, active or passive replicas. You can architect your system able to be fault tolerant and favor inside of a data center, inside of two data centers, um, such that you don't lose any data, configure any number of backups in memory, you can run things transactionally, you can read and read through to a variety of underlying technologies, RDBS, HDFS, local soft space. So um, sure IMC always provide some level of tiered storage. So DRAM first, certainly local swap, although I'd argue if you're spending too much time in swap, you probably don't have your system architected completely properly, or maybe not sized properly, but nonetheless, that capability is there. And of course, obviously, there are DBMS and HDFS systems. Now, there's 
the interesting thing that we see. So data, and certainly are examples of really big, big, big data. But what's interesting is that of 89% of operational data sets are 10 terabytes or less. Terabytes is a very approachable number. I've got multiple clients saying anywhere from 10 to 20 terabytes in memory across a relatively modest number of servers, quite frankly. And it, it is, you know, when you get right down to it, very approachable in terms of uh, in terms of having your complete data in memory. So, um, the interesting thing there, not durable is simply not true. There's there's very much durability here. And a little bit of a forward-looking statement. There's some very interesting stuff coming up with non-volatile flash that is certainly going to change the hardware landscape on this um, uh, substantially. Uh, so, so lots of interesting things here. Uh, number two, definitely actually need to. Uh, to debunk. Now, often I will hear that flash, meaning uh, flash uh, based approaches to flash, is fast enough. And on PCIe is, well, quite frankly, still a block device. And what that means is it's still a disk drive. It's a third one, for sure. I will not argue that. It's very much faster than the hard disks that it is replacing, and there are lots of advantages of that. But the point is that even with Flash, that you, you still are going through your, IO, your OS IO, you're going through your IO control, you're on a different bus, all this marshalling and buffering and uh, various things that need to be done. And if you're writing data that's smaller than the block size, there's just inherent inefficiency in all of this. And if you really want to go fast, and coupled with the fact that the price is dropping and operational data sets are really 10 terabytes or less when you get right down to it, is, is very much the, the answer. And it's, it's just substantially, substantially faster in terms of I.O. and access. And that, again, goes back to the hardware that underlies you know, my software stack. I spend a lot of time talking about soft hardware because it's an enablement for my software stack. There. So again, some things to think about there when you're looking and evaluating flash-based technologies. It's uh, you know, where is the data being written? Is it being written to a block device? Is, is it in and out of the I/O? Now, I remember earlier when I sort of kicked this whole thing off that we started to talk about, you know, in-memory databases are sort of synonymous right now with in-memory computing. And you know, memory computing and the whole ocean of that and the platforms and technology, it's not really a product. It's a, it's a technology and architecture. It's really very much applied to different products, different payloads in different ways. And you need to be able to do a variety of things together. Um, so simple caching is, is simply not enough. Caching is great. It makes up for the deficiencies in disk drive. There are a lot of great caching technologies out there. But don't confuse that. You should be considering as a, as a sort of true or full stack or full service in memory computing class. Um, in memory databases is, is not enough. You will certainly get a performance gain there. I'm not saying anything otherwise. But it is very important for today. But it's easy to adopt because we're all familiar with, with in memory databases. But again, it's going to top out. You have to be able to. Um, handle the ingestion of data, the processing of data, and with databases, certainly you get queries, which again leads to analytics, but it doesn't do any sort of substantial processing across this. So the the point is there, great use case for today, but not sufficient for the entire platform. Now, the other thing that's happening right here is, is that streaming data, frankly, streaming data in many respects can only be supported on every computing platforms such that have linear scalability, the ability to be able to scale this out, be able to store data, which is why streaming only technologies frameworks, they're they're simply not sufficient. Your your you know, reality is you're going to either be integrating two to five different technologies depending on what you want to do for in memory computing, or you're looking at a vendor like Rick Game that provides the entire full stack here. Um, very steep learning curve with that um, around the full um, integration points. And where we see the market going is that vertically focused, so problem specific and or plug and play products that are very much the future. So essentially ex plug in, accelerate technologies like Hadoop um, provide the maximum benefit with the minimum 
of integration. So, um, pause there and uh, make a call out for any questions that you might have. I don't. I certainly don't see anything in the Q and A section. I'm happy to do that, and obviously try and get things primed for um, primed for the Q and A on towards the end of the session. Now. Before I finished up, I wanted to give you a couple of representative use cases. Uh, obviously, these are driven from our um, our uh, companies, but I think they highlight some very interesting interesting things about the difference of, of what I'm talking about. So let's just talk a little bit about um, the first use case. It's a financial services use case. Uh, design real-time risk analytics. So in this specific case, it was a hedge fund with a mid-sized book, about a thousand options. And it could take to come changes the risk profile, initially how, whether I'm going to make money or lose money, um, on these kinds of things. Now, what's interesting is um, for every take, every every option, it's really only um, total for these thousand options about a gigabyte of data. Sound like uh, anything approaching big data, and probably even sound, frankly, like an in-memory computing problem. But here's a subtlety on this. So the point of this is that as you start to scale this, if you want to do a bigger size book, that obviously increases the amount of data that you have to fetch uh, on each time. They started with a traditional architecture, a BMS system underlying what essentially was a client application, the Java base doing queries and pulling that data out. Now, the, the problem is, is they quickly saturated the network when they wanted to double the size of their book, go to from 1,000 to 2,000. Um, they were doing some deeper type analytics on this as well, which increased the computational component. So what they tried was they actually moved to uh, a cache, just an ordinary cache. They said, well, okay, let's cache this data on the nodes and we'll bring that up. Well, that's fine, but that's the reality of that, even with the caching, is that they were quickly saturating the network again because they actually had to be um, moving uh, moving data around, and that quickly quickly scaled. Now, let's look at it from an in-memory computing standpoint, and I, I will I will really admit that this is actually biased because it's my perspective and my product, but nonetheless, I think that's representative what we see in an computing platform. She and I'll tell you why and how they chose us and, and what their advantage to them was. So with grid game, you have, again, remember the ability to compute. You have the ability to store. So what they actually did is put together a, a comparatively small grid, quite frankly. It was about, uh, I think they started with about 40 servers or so, uh, 40 nodes. And they put the data across those notes. We did check up. We did one backup to make sure there was some fault tolerance and resiliency there. This data could be re recreated, so that, that was sufficient for what they wanted to be able to do. The ability to compute there, and the ability now, rather than moving data around with every market tick for every every uh, position that they have, we actually now have the ability to do in the computational unit, as we're up to the new where the data was so things are partitioned out to the node where the data resides. Now, what's the the advantage of that? Well, it executes locally. It's all in process on one machine being accessed from RAM. I have very little data that's moving around the network. And what's very interesting is they scaled their book when it's under 4,000 different um, that they're holding the market for thousand different options. Their latency pre grid gain was about on a quarter of the quarter of the book, quarter of the size of the book was about 1.25 seconds or so, and afterwards at about half a second, added more complexity to their risk analytics model because essentially they can scale as need to by simply. And, and I actually, this is a guy I, use, I quote often. He says, I love you because I just stack them and rack them. Coming back to in-memory computing, you have compute embedded with the data. You have data partition. And you have the ability to scale almost limitlessly, as it were, by simply adding additional nodes. So a very um, interesting use case and how that actually 
was working um, for them and their advantage to be able to do it. And they will be the first to tell you they could not do this in the sense of having a technology like Precane in order to do uh, to, to provide the in-memory computing platform. So let's talk about uh, logistics use, which is actually quite quite interesting to me when I was working with these folks. Maybe it's my uh, my romantic notion, as it were, of of games uh, and roll down the tracks from my days of uh, of, of my childhood, but modern motors terabytes of data. There's three data, you know, asked where am I, what am I doing, and there's sensor data across the entire engine. All of the um, composure, fluid levels, levels, all of the different things that make up a very complex engine are monitored, and they spin terabytes of data, and they stream all of this data back. Now, as you can imagine, if you end hundreds, thousands of of these locomotives, it becomes a scale issue very, very quickly. And what a customer of mine found is that they simply could not ingest this stuff and run it out to traditional disk-based technologies fast enough. It just simply simply could happen. It's very much like staying in front of a fire hose, if you will. And what's interesting is it, 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 it poses an interesting challenge for all of us as technologists. It never stops. There's no beginning. There's no middle. There's no end. Well, I suppose there's a beginning. You first turn the system on, but the point is there's no catch-up time. There, the data is always on, and it's this sort of giant fire hose that's blazing at you without actually stopping. And you only have two options to catch up. You drop data, or you have some sort of scalable platform that allows you to be able to do that. Now, data and making sense of this data is one thing, and it's quite interesting. It was a problem to solve, but then you add on an additional computational layer of complexity, as it were. What happens if I have a switch that's broken? Well, now I just throw out what to get right around this, in what order, so that I can meet my SLAs on cargo delivery, so I can, and you, you can optimize this for missing financial penalties, maximizing my savings on fuel. There's all these different factors that go into this. So it's a complex computational model that you've got running. You've got data streaming at you that you need to react in real time. And quite frankly, figuring this out overnight or uh, tomorrow doesn't actually help you very much. Now, this is actually net new sort of technology and problems for for my customer because, uh, you know, five years ago, four years ago, I mean, none of the, the, the locomotives had this level of sensors. It just simply wasn't the data volume just simply wasn't there. And you can't do this. You can't scale and just this data, scale and compute across this, get shipping data around to the processing nodes that are processing layer, essentially just doing the processing. You've got to embed the compute in place with the data and do in-place analytics on data. So that's new. Um, I hope you're noticing a bit of a pattern here, which I'll point out. Um, I suggestion of data, a computational model, and the ability to store a level of data across um, our memory data space, at least two, two, three of those in all, all use cases. And the way that you can evaluate your own use cases aims to memory computing and what it can bring to you in terms of uh, inter benefits. Um, is, is a very interesting one as well. Um, I had no idea, or I guess I'd never thought about this before I got involved with this customer as well, but it is very, very expensive to turn on a new turbine or turn on an entire power plant. And the time that a generating company reaches its capacity, they're essentially delivering all the power that they can without flipping a switch and turning something on. It's a very complex decision that actually drives that. So you'll have companies that essentially are vertically integrated. They're selling to the market, both commercial and residential. They are trading energy on, on the spot market. They have generation, uh, they have cogen capability to be able to, to deliver power to the grid to meet this demand. And what's fascinating is that when they're making this decision, there are, in this case, there are 28 different factors that they consider just environmental factors. What day is it? How fast is it? 
how is this compared to historical norms? What temperature? What forecasted temperature in the next 30 minutes, next hour, next 24 hours, and 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 so on. And what you've got here then is all the data streaming into us, come sensors coming from the smart meters, coming from all my environmental sensors, come from my power plants. You have to ingest all of this data and make sense of it. Put it in some kind of representation that you can then you can then uh, do analytics across that. You have historical models for what happens when it's uh, when it's uh, when it's 46 degrees and and it shouldn't be and it's outside of the historical norm. And run a complex analytics across this. You keep a subset of your operational data in memory and with along with your historical data, and you'll be able to scale this up and down. in order to make that decision, do I turn on a plant, do I buy on the spot market, or do I do nothing? Because I don't think I can make money if I do any other move there. So very much fascinating, fascinating use case. Again, sort of net new analytics. They were doing bits and parts and pieces of these, but we've got smart meters and better sense and better implementation uh, instrumentation rather on all of their equipment. Fascinating problem. And again, that streaming plus data plus compute is, is a very much ideal use case across that. And finally, among many others that we could talk about is um, really about, uh, well, this is an interesting one about oil and gas drilling. So apparently there's, um, uh, who knew, uh, there are seismic data sensors across all fracking fields. And after you hear this, it sort of makes sense because these, in these seismic monitors pick up all sorts of uh, data that that they use to determine whether or not they're going well uh, at, at, at the drill bit, at the, at the head down. And the reality is that drill bit itself is centered and sends data back. And it can, they, they, in theory, are supposed to combine all of this information to ensure that there's not some sort of environmental impact or issue with what they're doing. And, and this technology is not approachable by anything other than any memory computing platform because you need to be able to linearly scale this. You again have streaming data. You have a computational model, in this case analyzing all the seismic data, and you need to be able to keep some of this information available to you um, for um, data available to you in memory for a certain period of time. So um, with, with that, I've actually come to the end of the slide that um, I wanted to cover today to talk to you about this type of technology. I am happy to do Q&A here um, insofar as we've got questions to answer. Um, that, would be, uh, that would be great. I typically see a lot of questions raised after these presentations. So um, we, we've got one question, um, good question coming up here with respect to, you know, is this a commodity scale of technology or is it a, a scale up? Technology and to replace some of big heavy duty uh, appliances that I might be using. Um, speaking from Great Gains' perspective, um, I actually happy being a scale out technology along with the scale up technology. Um, you can do any combination of both. I've got uh, folks that scale up and out. I've got folks that just scale out on commodity. An interesting thing about it when it's compared to some of the sort of dedicated appliances, the dedicated appliances are great insofar as you fit within their performance characteristics. And when you bump into the top of that, it either gets extraordinarily expensive or it actually becomes technically impossible or improbable to be able to sell that up with, with an in-memory computing platform, which is remember, distributed from the get-go. It actually, um, you can actually just continue to scale, as I say, in an almost unlimited, uh, in an unlimited uh, um, processing fashion. And here, the streaming plus data compute. How are scale? How how is the, the, they scale the data storage and parallel processing done? Well, in our case, that was obviously done with grid gain. And we actually have, we actually come from high performance computing roots. The longest, uh, and I probably just gave myself up as a, as a native Canadian to have said that, but um, the um, HD nation of this, so you essentially you have to be able to do compute. Now, they're not doing map reduce per se, they were actually just doing atomic task execution across their data set. And the storage it was run across a set of commodity servers. Um, they had about, they had about a hundred and 50 or servers for their their sort of first go round of this, 
uh, they were relatively average profiles. Um, I can't recall specifically with respect to uh, uh, the, um, you know, can't remember specifically with respect to the uh, the actual overall memory component on this, but within the tens of terabytes, um, they had tens of terabytes on that. So as you know, they say, about 100 meters or so uh, for the first round here. If you have any other questions, now would be a very good time to um, actually ask uh, ask those via the chat capability. Hi, let me just jump in here really quick. I know one of the most common questions that we always get is if people are going to get a copy of the presentation and the recording. And just a reminder that we will send out a copy um, of both within the next next two business days, um, along with anything else requested throughout the uh, throughout the webinar. And yeah, so please, ever, I was bragging to John about how active you guys are, so please do definitely jump in and add your questions there in the Q&A. We see a couple more coming in. John, if you want to, um, you, if you want to get those going, if you want me to... Um, well, no, yeah, absolutely. So we've got a question about data modeling and, and applicable to this technology. And I, I mean, I think certainly data modeling is applicable to it, it depends on sort of what you mean if you want to sort of clarify that question for me. Certainly uh, with respect to data modeling itself, I'd, I'd be happy to. But thoughts, um, the very simplest distillation of, of what technology is under the covers for us, we are a key value to store under the covers. You need know, object representation of your data in some fashion. Now, I also give you a JDBC-based view of the world, meaning a table-based view of the world, same thing under the covers key value, but you can expose it as a table base, and you issue straight up SQL, uh, uh, SQL query um, thoughts as well. I actually am going to be implementing uh, or releasing rather the, the, of, uh, the beginning of next year uh, a document, a straight up document API. We're going to be introducing a whole API. Uh, you can get at the data programmatically, simplest way, puts and gets, obviously object rep representation there. We give you a, a wide variety of different ways that you can actually do that. So typically for us, you, what you would do is that you have object representation of your data that you would be there and you can obviously query. So um, that, that depending on doing your data modeling, of course, that would be applicable to uh, the like we support, you know, JOR mapper, you know, hibernate, things like that um, as well. And another question came in, John. What's the high-level architecture and flow of great gain? Well, for us, we actually, you know, we have the luxury, I guess, or the foresight. I'm not sure which to say, Shannon, but we had the uh, when we took a greenfield approach to our design uh, many years ago. Now, um, we actually consciously made the choice to make our deployment architecture as simple as possible. So we have a very lightweight node deployment. The notion of a node and of the uh, at startup, I guess I'll say every node is equal. That's not to say that some nodes don't become data nodes. Um, you know, don't become specific. You know, I'm sorry, we don't have logical caches across physical nodes. Um, the point really being is that um, it's simple, very simple to start, um, very simple to operate, and um, essentially anywhere you can run a JVM you can run a grid gain node, which will then take sort of maximum advantage, as it were, of the, the underlying hardware that it's running on. So it, uh, I'm not saying, I'm not going to say that this is a practical uh, practical use of grid gain, but we do amuse ourselves every now and again by firing up grid gain nodes on, uh, on an Android handset. And the reason I say that is to really illustrate how lightweight and straightforward this deployment architecture is. But a high level in terms of getting data in and out, if you can do puts and gets, you certainly, if you to use a hash map, you certainly can um, certainly get rolling with grid gain. And in terms of task execution, it's a standard you can reduce. I'll say it's probably one of the most familiar ones, of course, because of what, uh, of what Hadoop has done in the industry for us. But it's a very straight up, uh, if you are a, uh, you know, a, a, a standard uh, enterprise Java programmer, you will have no issue working with grid gain. And that we put ourselves on is that a grid gain application, once, you, once you've written your application to work with grid gain, you run it on two nodes, 20 nodes, two nodes, and the application knows no difference except for the fact that it, it, uh, it has more processing capability and data storage available to it. So it's very seamlessly scalable 
um, hot standpoint. Just on cash a little bit, John, and the, and the, the question, of course, goes a little bit deeper into that. Um, do you exploit any cash-sensitive data structures, such as cash-sensitive index structures and processor cash, as in such as L1 and L2 cash? So we don't do anything specific. So remember, we're we're sort of abstracted to the JDM layer. So I am not going down into the hardware level and taking advantage of any specific processor caching technologies or L1 and L2 do anything like that. I'm not, uh, I'm just simply not doing that. Well, I also don't do any of the um, FPGA stuff. I mean, I've got some folks using that, but um, I don't do anything specific for that. And really that's for a couple reasons. One, because we don't need to. Um, we can, we've got some fairly optimized things that we've done inside the product. We, we, we you know, very, very deeply down in there and make sure that the things are performed. The um, short answer is we actually don't do anything with that. Um, and uh, um, you know, happy to talk about the use cases specific. You know, after the event, I'm not too hard to find. You can find me at Creek Gain or LinkedIn, at uh, Twitter if you want. A variety of different things. So, um, short answer: No, nope, don't do anything specific with those because our caching technology, we've written all of our own uh, technology um, to operate at the ABM level. I'll get your contact information out too in the follow-up email, um, so everyone has that information. And the next one is: How is this different from hash processing in AS, and what is the maximum limit or the maximum limit of processing? Well, there there is no theoretical limit of, of there is theoretical limit to the the processing. Uh, I have the product optimized in terms of the way that we store data and operate on data effectively. There, there's no limit. I mean, what's the addressable memory space of a 64-bit processor? Um, you certainly are partitioning data and processing across the uh, the nodes in the architecture. And the point to that is, is that if you need more capacity, you can simply add capacity in the form of additional, additional nodes across additional hardware, obviously, or virtual environments or public environments. And one of the things that's an advantage of in-memory computing technology in general, and certainly grid gain specifically, is you can simply just tell up additional processing and power. Um, it's not actually just simply, um, you know, we, we have a very robust set of parallel execution um, technology, so MapReduce, MPP, SMP, RPC, I, I was fully acronym compliant, which I will admit to uh, in terms of that. So, um, I think we'll essentially uh, answer the question. Um, now, in terms of SAS hashing or hash processing, I mean, we are we are much, much more than sort of just a simple hash table. Yes, under the covers, you know, we you can you can do with a very simplistic hash, but um, with very additional capability on top of that. In your reference noting, um, does this imply replication? That's a great question because um, when you look at technologies, you can in memory computing technologies and database data storage technologies. So yes, we do replicate. There's a couple of answers to this, or a couple of subtleties, I guess, or a couple of different ways I can interpret this. So on a node basis, yes, I am going to replicate data. Now there. Are Let's just take the storage uh, part of this for a second. On one side of things, if you will, at the extreme, it's a fully replicated data store. And what that means is all there resides on all nodes. And, um, you know, similar caching use case, right? I mean, of all in all places, it's very good for read mostly. Um, that's limited by the fact that your largest memory space that you can have in a fully replicated environment is determined by the smallest memory space available on the nodes that up, uh, nodes that make up your whole topology. So, partition is where we see most of most of our customers go. In that case, you pick up um, sort of the choice of how written you want things to be. And so, by way of example, you can set the number of backups for an individual element that you want to have. So, uh, sorry, uh, I probably uh, create confusion. You can set the number of backups that you would like to have uh, ac across the node. So in typically, you know, typically we see two 
backups is sufficient in order to guarantee the level of availability that you would want. I'll give you the real example. I've got a customer that runs us across two data centers. It's a couple thousand nodes and split between New York and uh, the UK. Now, this is actually one giant grid that runs across the two, but it has geo geolocal preference. So the clients in New York uh, have a bias to operate uh, against data that is in New York. And the clients, conversely, same thing with the UK data. And, um, in that case, we Two backups, one to local, so it's up on two different physical pieces of server, a data center in New York, and then one remote. In this way, you can actually have a failure of um, fail a node in New York, still process in New York, have the entire New York data center go down, still be able to process, and have the UK data center pick up the workload. So one way that we, we replicate data, we are very good about how we do this. One of the things that you should always look at when you're looking at in-memory computing technologies is to ask your vendors the question, what happens when I add additional nodes? The answer for grid game is that we actually add nodes dynamically and rebalance dynamically such that there's no interruption in processing of data. Um, you should make sure that you actually check that around. Um, then you motion of data data center replication. So if you're running active, passive uh, across two data centers for DR, there is also the ability to replicate either transactionally or non-transactionally to that data center, to that backup data center. So that's the way that we certainly uh, that we certainly handle that. I love all these questions coming in. The next question, John, is uh, does this technology support data access via standard SQL APIs, or does it require using uh, proprietary grid gain APIs? So that is both. So if you want to um, query me, and to be clear, um, it's a read-only uh, SQL access, but that's typically for what, what folks want to do with SQL in terms of analytics and querying, obviously. Um, you can just do straight JDBC connection, uh, straight standard, select star from employees where company equals grid gain or by higher date. Standard SQL. We'll, uh, we'll run across that. We handle everything that needs to be handled underneath the covers to get you your data and, and uh, give you a row set result set back on that. So that's only it. But you obviously also can use proprietary Greek gain API to go and get that data. At the simplest fashion, it's puts and gets, um, fully transactional support, asset compliant transactions across that. Very robust and rich set of APIs that you have available to you. So the answer is both. Whichever way that you would like to see us uh, access us, uh, you can. Uh, I mentioned a little earlier. I'm actually going to be adding a um, Johnson AI, actually the MongoDB API as sort of the de facto standard for uh, based access. That's going to be available uh, the end of Q1, 2014. Um, we really like to make it easy to get data in out and query data and work with data in the ways that you would be, uh, you know, here with as a standard, standard as it were. Uh, next question, does adding additional memory uh, storage and processing impact the I.O., or does it impact CPU processing? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I'm not sure I fully appreciate where the uh, the attendee is going with that question, but um, obviously there is some, at some point, there is some I.O. sensitivity, and typically we help our customers sort of balance the hardware profile in terms of what they want to do in terms of memory on the nodes. And the CPU impact, for instance, is, is really has more to do with the types of tasks and processing that you're doing than retrieval of data per se. Um, obviously, things are very quick when you're operating in process and memory. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a balance between those two. But I, and I have scale-up customers, so you know, sort of packed on the CPU power and a whole lot of memory in, in a single box. Sometimes that's appropriate. Sometimes it's more appropriate to have commodity boxes. Sometimes, frankly, it's just simply a, um, you know, a financial consideration for my customers. So there's no hard and fast rule uh, with respect to, um, you know, how all of these things interrelate. It's very much more use case specific. With respect to O, we've done a lot of optimizations, everything from our marshalling and serialization routines, our inter process communication is very really efficient. We are very sort of not um, sort of not uh, not key as it were uh, in terms of our protocols and inter process communication. So very highly optimized. 
And a uh, question came in. At Reviewing Great Games website, I don't see Oracle as a supported product. Is there a reason Oracle is not supported? Oracle is absolutely supported. I am going to go find a web webmaster and have, have, a, have a discussion. Well, so, I mean, you may not specifically call it out um, one or the other, but Oracle would be essentially an underlying data store for us, and we support almost anything under the sun. If you name the database technology, within limits uh, that I've got a customer that's actually running it. So I have many, many, many customers running Oracle underneath this big an Oracle rack or something like that. Um, no SQL, uh, sorry, MySQL, um, you know, Postgres, um, you know, SQL Server, Sybase, all the usual suspects in terms of database technology, Mongo, that matter, uh, React, you know, a, a bunch of different stuff that runs underneath it. Straight HDFS. I've got some folks that run us on storage attached, uh, network attached storage type things and files. So, so a lot of different things. So um, George, don't worry. We're full full Oracle support, first class citizen for uh, for working with great games, certainly. Okay, and, and we are getting uh, close to the top of the hour here. I just have one last question for you. Um, is it that uh, from my own perspective, there's obviously a lot of we have a lot of architects on the line. Um, any advice uh, to that you have for um, in terms of architecture that you want to throw out for the um, as for best practices in terms of incorporating great gain? Yeah, so what I will say is is this: you very much when you're evaluating these technologies, you know, absolute memory database is sufficient for your needs today. Make sure that you look forward in terms of, of where you need to be only 12 to 18 months, you're going to notice a huge change against this. Now, some things you should look for in terms of, of these types of technologies. Ask about scalability. Ask your vendors to prove their scalability if they're claiming elasticity and linear scale. I'm happy to do that for anybody that asks me in terms of my customers. Um, make sure that you understand your fault tolerance strategies yourself. Make sure that you understand and appreciate the trade-offs between the various ways that you can read and write through and the ways that you can create backups across the entire infrastructure on all of that. Make sure one of the big, big ones that I'll come back to, I just point out, is make sure you understand how you can add nodes. So it could actually elasticity, but um, what happens when you dynamically add nodes? Can you do it? Can you see that? What happens, I'll give you a great example on this, what happens in terms of resiliency when you're having issues in nodes dying? I had one financial services customer that put me through a grueling test where they would start 100 nodes every 10 seconds. They would then have a script that was doing lines on the processes across the grids. And then just for fun, they had an engineer standing behind their network rack pulling out Ethernet cables. Um, you know, for us, we come through that with 100% no data loss. But make sure that you put your technology there. Look at your vendors. Look at the stacks and trade-offs for the maturity. We're lucky. We came from open source roots. We had five major five new releases, even though we look like a young company. So I would say, um, you know, that's the top of my mind. Those are those are the kinds of key things that we always help our customers with and that I think your architects should be should be thinking about when they're actually adopting these in memory computing uh, technologies. But John, thank you so much for this great presentation and 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 explanation and, and thank you everybody for the active question. I love it as you know when you guys get involved and and have a lot of questions for the speakers. Um, John, thank you so much, and I hope, and everybody, thank you so much for attending, and thanks to Great Gain for sponsoring this webinar, of course. And uh, you know, if you have any other questions, again, I'll get the the uh, female out within two business days, containing links to the slides, the recording of this presentation, as well as John's contact information, so that you can, if you have any further questions, you can be sure and get him that appropriate information. So, thanks, everybody. And John, if you mind sending me a copy of the presentation too, I'll get that out so I can get that out to everyone. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining and sticking with us here through the presentation. I will have the presentation to Shannon in about 20 minutes, and uh, she will have it out to you shortly. I'll look forward to hearing from some of you. And uh, if you have any questions after this, please don't hesitate to uh, to shoot me an email. I'm always happy to help. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.